G'day. Welcome to this time together, the opportunity to worship God. As we gather, hear the words of the psalmist from Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. For in your righteousness, deliver me. This is the God we come to, the God of rescue, the God of salvation, the God who meets us where we are and then leads us to a new place, a place in his grace. Let's pray. Loving Father God, as we gather to worship this day, whenever, wherever, we gather in you. We gather in the presence of your spirit, in the embrace of your love, in the hope of your word. We gather in the name of Christ. Lord God, as we spend this time, we would ask that you would anoint each one of us with a fresh anointing of your spirit, that we would know you present in our hearts and our lives. We would know you at work, transforming who we are and how we live, that we might more fully be the people you created us to be. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing in praise of our God. In the book of Acts, we find the story of Stephen, a man chosen to be a leader of the early church, particularly in the space of uh, making sure that all are provided for. Not as a great orator, but as an administrator. Someone who is respected and trusted by the various factions of the early church. Yeah, you heard me right. Even in those early days, there were factions. In this case, it was a complaint um, by the Greek-speaking members of the church, those who were historically Jewish but uh, culturally Jewish, but in their day-to-day -day life were Greek. 
using the language, many of whom were connected in business and various other ways. But at that space, there were disputes. And so the disciples of Jesus appointed some folk to help them lead the community. One of those men was Simon. Simon? Stephen. Took me names wrong here. Stephen. He, along with that role, played a role in speaking out about who Jesus was and ends up in a bit of a barney in the synagogue, which leads to a trial in the Sanhedrin. We find that in Acts 7. And following the trial, he's dragged out and stoned. And as he is stoned, there are two really interesting phrases attributed to him. The first is the sense that he gave up his spirit. And the second is the way in which he prays grace and forgiveness on those who are killing him. Clear reflections of the Jesus experience on the cross. An echo of Psalm 31.5, which reads, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And at this execution, one Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, is present. The consequences of this experience is that many people of the Christian faith, these followers of Jesus, these first disciples of the church, leave Jerusalem. And so the commission in uh, Matthew 28 comes to pass that the gospel is taken to the ends of the earth. Taken perhaps somewhat reluctantly, taken because those that take it are scared for their life following the stoning of Stephen. Fascinating, ain't it? How we as Christians with this good news, this message of hope and freedom, are reluctant to get out of our comfort zones and let others know. It applies as much to the conversations we have in the supermarket as it does to taking on a role as a missionary in some far off world. The story of Stephen, a follower of Jesus, a leader of the church, who speaks with boldness, dies for his faith. And yet, in the horror of that moment, being criticised and condemned in front of a kangaroo court where justice is absent, two key things happen. First, he asks God for forgiveness, for grace, for those who are doing evil to him. He extends compassion to them. He extends the love of God to them. And secondly, in the moment, he retains control of who he is and gives up his spirit. And the question is how? How does a person faced with pain, faced with shame, faced with injustice and violence and despair, retain grace, love, gentleness, courage, strength and hope. They do it 
we do in the power of the risen Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we look at Stephen and we think of how his short journey as a leader of the church unfolds. A faithful man, a good man, a fair man, a respected man within his community. And he shows us how to hold tight in you, how to hold on to those qualities that we look upon and respect, how to be a disciple of Jesus, how to be a man who is faithful and faith-filled. Lord God, we thank you for examples like him and so many others. We confess that we very easily put them on a shelf and say they were special and we couldn't possibly be them. And yet, Lord God, that is exactly who you call us to be. A people willing to sacrifice that others might know your love. A people willing to extend the grace that lives might be turned around. A people who entrust their spirit to your hand. For you, O oh God, are faithful. And so, Lord, we, in great humility and gratitude, Accept the gift of grace in Jesus, the forgiveness for our sin, and the opportunity to love our neighbours, our communities, and our world. And so, Lord God, this day we would pray for all those who suffer injustice, all those who are marginalised and pushed out of the way by the powers that be. We ask your grace for them, your love for them, a place for them. Lord, for all of those who suffer, whether it be the suffering of exclusion, the suffering of shame, the suffering of disease, of trauma, We pray your healing, your way forward, your kingdom come. Lord, as we continue with how to respond to the great injustices in the world, war, and dispossession, hunger, Give us your wisdom, we pray, and lead us that we might follow in your ways, seeing what you are doing and bearing witness to your works of grace and mercy in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue. In song.
A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, starting at verse 1. John, chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. A passage that is often used as a word of comfort at funerals. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the middle of the Last Supper. He's already highlighted his impending death, predicted Peter's denials. He's responding to the emergence of anxiety and stress in his disciples. And he's anticipating the sheer terror and despair that is to come. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. It is a word of encouragement. And it is a command. It functions as both. And there are days where perhaps we need to hear one or t'other slightly more than the other. There are days when all is black around us, when it's dark and we just want to hide at the bottom of the bed with the doona over our head, where we need to hear that encouragement, that we can, we can trust in God. And that the very act of trusting in God guards our heart. And there are days we need to be told to get off our bum, to stop trusting in other things, our own abilities, our riches, our programs, our buildings, excuse me, itchy nose, all of those other things, and just trust in God. For that will be the way that our hearts will be less troubled. I don't believe for a moment that Jesus is saying, don't be sad, don't be upset. But what I do hear is him saying, don't let the griefs and the fears, the anxieties and the hurts of this world overwhelm you. Don't let them so oppress you that you can't live the life you are given. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And then he starts to flesh that out. How can this be that in all of the things that could happen to us, we can trust? Because Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. So in the fullness of time, we can trust in him. We can trust in him because there is this engagement with a God who is actively working to provide a place for us. And I know in the various translations of the Bible, there are arguments about whether it's a room in God's house or mansions in God's, you know. Get over it. It's a place in the presence of God. It's like, for me, in my head, it's, you know what? I think being in the, the unadulterated presence of God, you know, without the limitations of who I am anymore, without the limitations of this world, being in the pure, unadulterated presence of God, I won't give a rat about whether I've got a room or a mansion or a straw mat. I'm with God. You know what I mean? There's something powerful about hearing this word to us, about embracing the promise it contains, that our God, revealed in Jesus, present in the Holy Spirit, loves us so much that we don't have to fear. We don't have to be overwhelmed by the heartache of this world, by the, the media storms that arise around us, because God has it in hand. And this is a, a message of the scriptures, a message of the faith that is as old as God is. God is providing. God provided for Adam and Eve. They mucked it up. God provides for the people when they escape Egypt. He offers them the promised land and they get there and they go, oh no, it's too scary. And they mess it up. When the people finally do get in there, God says, for this to be the best it can be, here are some, some rules. Here are some ways of living that will bless you. Keep focused on me and love those around you. Don't kill, don't steal, don't uh, suffer from desire, from FOMO, the fear of missing out. Just embrace the beauty of what you've received. This is the story of God. Perhaps most um, powerfully put in the book of Revelation. And I know, you know, often we go to that book and, and people try to work out you know, what the various imagery means and, and how it's applicable in this day and age. Folks, the book of Revelation really simply is, it's going to go pear-shaped. There's going to be some scary stuff out there. There's going to be stuff that you don't like. There's going to be persecution and oppression. It's not going to go to human plans. Relax. God has it in hand. And too often, I think, in the church, when we have studied the book of Revelation, we have actually minimized the promise. That is, God has this in hand and maximized the anxiety of, oh, what else can go wrong? God has it in hand. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in the Lord. Trust in Jesus. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the rod and the staff of God will protect you. We see that lived out in the life of Stephen, who dies. You know, what kind of protection is that? He gives up his spirit, knowing that what he endures is nothing when endured in the grace of God.
And that is the call of this scripture. That is the encouragement to Jesus, of Jesus to his followers. When this starts to go pear-shaped, folks, don't give up. Don't be overwhelmed. Trust me. I'm walking into this eyes wide open. I know what this journey will be, says Jesus. It'll be all right. God has it in hand. Now, I don't know that you and I have that kind of clarity of understanding. Occasionally, we are gifted that for a moment. But the word to us remains. Trust and get on with it. Be who we are supposed to be. Live and love in the way of Jesus. In this passage, places on us the opportunity to be a people of God, faithful and faith-filled. All of this passage helps us to understand that when we embrace Jesus fully, when we trust God with all we are, then our prayer will be the will of God. Because we won't be asking for things that are outside of the breadth of God because we will be aligning with God. Our ability, our capacity to be untroubled, unburdened, not overwhelmed by the world. Our capacity to be there. is defined, in a sense, by the levels at which we trust God. Friends, too often in the Christian faith, even though we have a theology of faith not works, becomes a theology of works because we talk about our efforts you know, if I'm strong enough and faithful enough and, and, and do enough of this and that and the other, then these good things will come. Jesus says, just trust me. Trust me. Trust me, I know what's going on. Trust me, I know the way. That isn't a matter of us doing, but us surrendering. Us in humility and gratitude, going, you know what? I couldn't manage this if I tried. Thank God he can. Let's pray. Loving Father God, you give us the Lord Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. You give us of yourself that in him we would know you and in knowing you we would know life. You give us the Holy Spirit, the strength we need for the journey. We pray this day that we, like Stephen, might be faithful and faith-filled, willing to take on the tasks you give us, be they as an administrator, be they as a preacher, be they as a pastoral carer, as a teacher, a grandparent, child, whatever the role is, Lord God, that you call us to, may we do it not in our own strength, but in your grace, your love, and your power. And as we do this, may we embrace the gift of your spirit, the one who is wisdom, who shows us the way the way of Jesus, the way of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's sing.
And now let's go. Trusting in Jesus. And if, folks, we are feeling overwhelmed by the world, then stop juggling all the balls. And take a moment to reconnect to the one who knows life to the full, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. May you know his presence and God's blessing this day. Amen.